All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, our um, ultimate structural heart case session, part three. Um, my name is Rahul Sharma. I'm co-moderating with uh, John Messenger and a great um, expert panel here. We're excited for this uh, session. Uh, we'll get started without further ado with our first presentation by Dr. Nishta Sodhi um, on prosthesis regret. All right, well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's a, really a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Nishta Sodhi, and I'm the medical director of the Structural Heart and Valve Program at the University of Virginia. I was invited to present a case on prosthesis regret. <clears throat> so let's jump right in here. So we have a 57-year-old female with past medical history significant for May Therner syndrome, for which she had stents to her left common femoral and her iliac veins. She had very profound and very significant debilitating congenital arthrogryposis involving multiple joint contractors, including her ship, hips, her shoulders, for which she was basically crutch dependent, and her height was a whopping four foot four. She had prior surgical aortic valve with a 21 Carpentier Edwards back in 2009 for bicuspid AS pathology. She basically at this point developed progressive symptomatic bioprosthetic stenosis. She was known to have a stable dilated ascending aorta measuring 4.3 centimeters on CT and no significant coronary disease on cath. So during our heart team discussion, given her redo status and her congenital arthrogryposis, we basically felt that a valve and valve taber for her was gonna be the best option under monitored anesthesia and transthoracic guidance. You can see here from her echo that she's got preserved LVOTVTI and stroke volume with high gradients, uh, well above four uh, for indication. And in looking at her through Mencio, you can see that her VTC to both the left and the right ostia are just about five millimeters. And so we felt fairly comfortable that we were not going to run into any sort of a coronary obstruction risk. And we planned for a 23 core valve in her prior 21. This is a still image, and I show this just for large bore axis on the right, and you get a sense really here of the very significant congenital deformations that she had, particularly in her femorals and really throughout all of her joints. On the left, you see her iliac uh, vein stents as well. And so here's her first aortogram here, and you can kind of get a sense of her anatomy, the dilated aorta at 4.3, and just sort of a little bit of the uh, displacement that you appreciate and also the horizontal aorta nature of her valve. So I'll be honest with you, I don't think I necessarily appreciated how difficult this was going to be to cross until we got in there. And this took nearly 15 to 20 minutes for us to actually cross uh, this surgical valve. It was probably one of the, the hardest ones that we've had in a while. And ultimately, it was an AL3 catheter that helped direct our wire into the ventricle. So you can imagine then that with that much difficulty, we of course had a lot of difficulty with the delivery system itself. And the issue was that we kept hitting the surgical post on her prior CE valve. And I'll be honest, we initially were, were thinking that it was gonna go with some aggressive manipulation of the delivery system, with wire manipulation, but long story short, as our, our preceding wire crossing should have told us, that was not gonna be the case. And ultimately, we used a buddy balloon and ultimately crossed and deployed the valve. So we thought, you know, looking at this angiogram, okay, pretty good result, we struggled, but you know, we got, we got this in, you know, trying to, uh, about to give fist bumps, but at that point, she starts developing ST elevations, 2-3 AVF, and complaining of chest pain. <laughs> so our initial reaction was to look at the coronaries, and upon selective engagement, although these are still images, there were no coronary issues uh, that we could detect upon engagement here. A few minutes later, she becomes hypotensive, and we start detecting pulses alternans on the monitor, and so we're now looking on her transthoracic for any sort of effusion causing tamponade. But as you may remember, her imaging was extremely difficult, uh, and we couldn't see anything on transthoracic. And so at that point, with her clinical deterioration, quickly uh, and emergently intubated and put in a TEE probe. And you can see here on the still image that her effusion was honestly all posterior, nothing sort of anterior, and that's probably why we were missing it on the transthoracic combined with her congenital deformations. And you know, we looked multiple windows and for anywhere we, we could stick a needle in, but due to the posterior nature, we decided that that was not gonna be any sort of an option. 
And so we essentially did an emergency surgical prep with surgical incision and left thoracotomy is probably a far more sophisticated way to describe what actually happened, which was our surgeon reaching in and scooping out coagulated blood to essentially evacuate the pericardium. And honestly, it was a, a small amount. It was mostly coagulated by the time that it came out. But of course, as we know, it's not so much the amount of blood that causes tamponade, it's just the physiology and the acute nature. And so even that small amount was enough to call this, cause this decompensation. Uh, once we gave protamine, interestingly enough, everything sort of stabilized and she had no more uh, fusion reaccumulation. And in looking back when we debriefed, we thought it was probably likely related to our sort of aggressive manipulation um, to try to cross the valve in the setting of her horizontal aorta and her congenital anatomy. Luckily, though, she was ultimately stabilized and, you know, ultimately got discharged. But I, I highlight this case. You know, we talk a lot, uh, you know, particularly in the beginning with this first generation self-expanding valves about horizontal aorta and procedural considerations. And certainly we can consider, you know, the type of valve to utilize in such cases. And of course, various techniques in terms of crossing the valve with buddy balloons, stair, te stair techniques, uh, as well as trying to really achieve that coaxial alignment and controlled implantation plantation and also anticipating and managing complications. So this was a multi-center registry that was just published in August of 2021 and you know the idea in sort of the earlier conversation was that in horizontal aortas, particularly when the ascending aorta is above 49-50 degrees, that there may be suboptimal procedural success, particularly with the first generation self-expanding valves. And what these folks reported in their uh, registry was that, as you can see here, just with the envelope R and pro valves, that there was a tendency to more procedural issues. Having said that, though, as Paul showed uh, the other day during our luncheon session with the new FX design, I think that the one spine technology of FX is going to largely overcome a lot of these issues in terms of manipulation in such anatomy. And so I think in conclusion, some tips and tricks. It's not that we can't use self-expanding valves. I think it's just that we need to keep in mind this anatomy and uh, when choosing a valve. And of course, as in all cases, prepare. I always tell fellows, prepare, prepare, prepare. Master your CT so that you can anticipate complications and challenges. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, as you all know, some of the, the various other pearls for crossing in such cases. And with that, I want to thank you guys for staying and for your attention and to, to Dr. Saraja and the whole organization team. Thank you, Nisha. That was a great case. Um, any questions, comments from the audience panel? The only thing I was going to say is that I think that's a, the angulation with ascending aortic aneurysm is like the one-two punch that, that really, you know, whenever I see that anatomy, I, uh, it's painful to do snaring up front, but we've, we've learned that, that that's what, where we get hurt, which is that ascending aneurysm when everything wants to be way rightward and you just can't cross these valves no matter what angle it is. Yeah, I agree with that. If I see horizontal, and I agree, by the way, the new generations, previously I would never touch a self-expanding for such a horizontal aorta, but now I agree it's, it's much more feasible. I generally will switch my workhorse wire to a Lundquist uh, because it just keeps you off, you know, pushing to the outer curve, it's, it's much less, much more rigid and so it keeps you a little more central. Um, and then low threshold to snare that stiff, rigid Lundquist if needed. Yeah, so when you snare, you're talking about gooseneck snare, contralateral yeah. and just using yeah. it to flex? Yeah. And we thought about that. Our issue was that we had barely crossed the valve after 20 minutes and so we, we were just like, oh, we don't want to mess around with this. Yeah, and I think that uh, for everybody, uh, new operators, understand the snare technique <laughs> is something that if you think in advance, you obviously are going to use the contralateral access, so you might have to get radial access then to then put your pigtail in. It then negates if you use through protection, you might have to get the left side access potentially in that case. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I had a case where I had trouble getting around the arch, kind of like yours, and I was pushing and pushing and one pushed too many and she died on the table. Yeah and I'm pretty sure I dissected. And so, so being really careful about being on that outer curve is really, really important. And you know, one of the things, and maybe I'll bring it to next year's case, I did a valve and valve um, in a coact, and I was so focused on implanting the valve high within the prior valve and valve prosthesis was small, um, getting a better gradient, that what I didn't appreciate was that all the tension was actually stored in the coact. And so I ended up embolizing the valve. And you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happened, but maybe I'll show that next year. <laughs> okay, so here's a question for you. So given that we have FX coming, and uh, that would be the ideal valve for a small valve like this, but would you choose Sapien, now knowing what you had done, if you didn't have FX options? It's tough because 
the EOA conversation that we always have, right? And this is a relatively young female. She was 57 and we had a 21 CE. And so that was ultimately why we, you know, even despite having this conversation up front, we did continue with the self-expanding valve. Was there any discussion in this case about bioprosthetic valve fracture? You know, we tend to take a look at hemodynamics and gradients, particularly post, and since we didn't really have any gradient, really, we felt that we didn't need to do that. That's a great question. Yeah, because the thing that I always struggle with in these cases is, you know, what are we going to do if we have to do BVF mm -hmm. intraprocedurally based on gradients and echo measurements? Because you're right, your VTC looked fine if you weren't going to do BVF, but if you were, you can't obviously predict how mm -hmm. that's going to get affected. Um, I had a case similar to this where I ended up recrossing because it was not hard to cross, so we decided to recross and we snared with a, a 25 millimeter gooseneck snare and it sailed through just fine. But, um, but in cases where the valve's small and the VTC is maybe marginal, uh, considering what would happen if you had to BVF or preparing up front for coronary protection, that obviously is a whole other dimension to this case. It's a great case, so thank you. All right, next up, uh, my esteemed co-moderator, Dr. John Messenger, is going to be presenting on coronary conflicts. Thank you very much. It's great. Thanks for the invite to be here at such a great meeting. This is a, a, a coronary conflict uh, that we had relatively recently. Um, so this is an 82-year-old woman uh, with uh, New York Heart Association Class II symptoms, severe aortic stenosis, the typical host of complications that go with that. Her son is a uh, neurosurgeon at uh, Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, um, which added to the fun of this. Um, uh, typical STS score for our cohort here. Uh, mean grading of 46, normal EF, not a ton of valvular regurgitation. She's an AFib on anticoagulation. BNP is elevated now. Coronary angiography demonstrated pretty reasonable coronary anatomy. We usually will take a scout shot, um, at least kind of a typical guess at our coplanar view, which wasn't very good in this view, but shows a pretty normal anatomy and, and nothing concerning. We've got our own measurements that our cardiovascular folks do. We have a 3D lab, so our measurements are, her perimeter was uh, 72 to 75 areas were in the 390 to 410 range. Sinuses of Alsalva were pretty spacious for it being um, the size of a valve with STJs that were fine. Coronary heights um, looked pretty reasonable, kind of in the 12, 13 range by our measurements, a little bit lower by uh, Edward's measurement, um, and not a ton of LV calcification, no significant angulation. These are just the representative images showing sinuses of Valsalva of 31 to 33, so pretty sizable for her annulus of, uh, of 23. Um, she sized sort of to the nominal prep of a 23 Edwards Ultra. Here's just our typical valve. We didn't have much concern in terms of our valve to coronary heights um, uh, being about 4.1 uh, and expanded height at 18 if we put it in at, at, at 80-20 or, or 90-10. Um, here's our pre-implant aortogram as we got in. We actually got a much better coplanar view. Um, Here's our valve going in. We thought we had pretty reasonable positioning of the valve. Um, no major issues with that. And this is our angiogram afterwards um, with this. And so my, my partners and I kind of looked at this, and obviously I don't know how well that plays up on the up on that uh, really well. right <laughs> image, but uh, we were a little bit concerned. Patient, this was with conscious sedation, had no symptoms at all, had no ischemic changes on ECG, hemodynamically completely stable, and we sort of scratched our head there for a few minutes and were like, gosh, we really didn't really have that on our radar for this case. Um, so we decided to just go ahead and let's, you know, I, we didn't believe our eyes, so we said, well, we'll just IVUS it and just, you know, I'm sure it's nothing, it's probably not in the way. And as we go to this pullback, we basically have complete obliteration of the left main. <laughs> and uh, this is just a huge chunk of calcium that is sitting up here in the left main. Um, and, you know, we said, what the F, obviously. Um, <laughs> went ahead and went to try to dilate this, and actually this thing was incredibly resistant to dilation. This is a 5012 onyx in this small 82-year-old uh, woman that we post-dilated um, with a 5.5 NC balloon. And despite that, 
we actually didn't move the calcium out of this left main, believe it or not. We, it was just this huge, the entire sinus of, of Valsalva was filled with this resistant material and had residual stenosis even after the 5.5 NC balloon. So it actually went back in, you can see there, it's like an oval stent as opposed to round. Ended up having to post dilate it with a 6.0 balloon to high pressures to get it to, to look reasonable. Um, but, uh, and I think we got a reasonable uh, lumen. It still is definitely not uh, completely circumferential and is still oval, but we thought it was large enough to get her down the road. Um, this is our post stent angiogram. You can just see how we packed this thickened leaflet. Um, it really wasn't calcified. We didn't really have much of an indication that this was gonna be so bulky off the CT scan um, and really weren't expecting this, but this was the follow-up angiogram. Um, I think the, the take home for us was that coronary conflicts can happen even if the measurements don't predict them. We talk about you know, coronary artery obstruction and, and things that go along with it, but, but sometimes you just have to understand that, that we aren't you know, perfectly scientific about this. And I think bulky leaflets and the, where the calcium is located, if it's in the leaflet tips and you aren't able to compress it, but rather you flip it up, sometimes it can cause trouble. And then obviously coronary imaging with IVUS is very helpful in decision making and stent optimization because I think we probably, had we not re ivised it, would have just left it with the 5.5 five and said that's a huge left main, but it wouldn't, probably would have come back to hurt us with re-stenosis. So she's, uh, in follow-up, she's here for her one-year follow-up uh, this week. So she's still doing well. Thank you very much. That's an excellent, excellent case. It brought back some uh, PTSD for me because I had the same exact scenario where the material embolized to the LED diagonal bifurcation, and the patient had recurrent VF on the table. We put him on bypass, put an impella in, and then I proceeded to do a bifurcation PCI with this heavily resistant material that just was the son of a gun to post dilate. Um, and the uh, patient ended up doing fine, but it was, I mean, it was like, you know, WTF, yeah. you know, where did this come from? This was a straightforward TAVR and turns into a lengthy case, so it's just very humbling. Uh, so still can't predict 100% what cases are going to go perfectly, right? Yep. Any other comments? So, John, <clears throat> you know, did you consider or do you have access to lithotripsy? Because I wouldn't have, like, thought about road of that because, it, you, to your point, it's not a piece of in calcium like a coronary lesion. It's, it's leaflet, right? And I would imagine if you try and road of that, you know, A, you could get the burr stuck in the leaflet or B, send that chunk downstream. But I wonder whether lithotripsy would just kind of soften and prep it to allow you to expand um, the stent a bit better, even after a stent maybe. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it was right, I mean, this was this was like July 25th of last year, so it was right when we were introducing IVL, at least in our lab, and I think it's also one of those things that it was like not a hundred and, you know, it was a hundred and twenty degree arc of it and whether it would work, I don't, I've not used a balloon that big, but uh, I think it's a great thought. We should have thought about it. I was thinking, I think IVL would be a really Good thought, and I was wondering, would you guys think CSI would work here? Because you you go in and then burr back. Yeah, possibly. I don't know anybody in the audience think that might work. No takers. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for cases for next year. <laughs> One. I think uh, awesome case, John, and I think it really highlights the importance and value of IVIS, not only for pre, but as you mentioned, post, because uh, that MLA of the left main, you can only really truly appreciate once you use IVIS. The other thing I was going to bring up is any of the panel using uh, leaflet length measurement on Thrumencio and CT and sort of the new ratios with, you know, leaflet length to coronary sinus height ratios. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we do that routinely on ours, but this was one of those cases, the sinuses were so big, like, you know, a 23 valve and a 32 sinus were like, I mean, and her length was about 11, 11 and a half, and her height by, by Edwards was, was 11. So we were cognizant of it, but we were like, you know, there's no way we'll ever get that, that close to the left main. Is this, is this a situation where we wish we had FIOPS or some other, a, you know, those, those uh, predictor models from from those fancy software packages that do more than just measure? I certainly think we're learning more about it. I think much yeah. like I'm always surprised when I ultrasound the legs, I think some of, you know, where you don't see any calcium on the CT scan, but it yeah. looks terrible by ultrasound. I think there are some of these leaflet morphologies that we'll learn, you know, with AI or other approaches that are, are more troublesome than others, like basal versus leaflet yeah. thickening. Anybody using FIOPS for, for CT for TAVR? No? 
Still no takers. All right, next, <laughs> next year. Perfect. Our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Eyinger, who's going to talk about malposition management. All right, folks, so let's go to the slides if we can. So this is going to be TAVR malposition management. And uh, really, like I said, the way we like to explain cases in this meeting is really to show, hopefully, either to avoid the problems we've run into or to at least get enlightened about what we've done during these cases. So I want to tell you with TAVR, we know there's an evolution of deployment. So we know the TAVR case numbers have increased exponentially over the last 10 years. And we know the issues of deployment have been improved with newer device iterations. But there's one particular area that can still create procedure-induced palpitations in the operator, and that's valve and valve TAVR. As we've seen earlier, we've initiated a great case, but valve and valve TAVR can be so, still somewhat complicated. The rigidity in surgical frames, the varying levels of lethal calcification and length, as well as ideal placement, because again, there's multiple different types of surgical valves, it are all issues to be taken into account. So I'll give you a case background. We have a 75-year-old male, history of biprosthetic AVR, 27 Edwards Perimount Magna Ease in 2005, has been complaining of shortness of breath, increased AVR gradients over the last 18 months with serial echocardiograms. Evidence of leaflet stenosis and immobility when concomitant moderately severe AI. And again, as we all know, biprosthetic valve failure doesn't often present with stenosis, but rather we start seeing a combination. We see stenosis slash regurgitation, and that could potentially lead to catastrophic valve failure if not caught early. So mild MR, moderate TR present as well with a slightly reduced EF. A TE was basically performed to get a better evaluation of this. As, and we were looking at this, and you can clearly see here, the leaflets are not normal. So obviously, in this view, you have two pairing views here. It is clearly not uh, coapting the way it should normally. And you can see here the perivalvular, or the valvular leak, I'm sorry, that's present as well. So we also had a dilated ascending aorta of 4.5 centimeters. So multiple discussions with the patient, family, and both of our cardiothoracic surgery attendings. Why did we have both of our CT surgery attendings? Because I'm going to be very honest with you. Patients always want the easy way out. But sometimes we need to have the hard conversation and say, you probably should have your chest open again because you have other things going on. But as we all know, this is how life is moved with TAVR. Patients will basically demand certain things. And as long as we have everyone on the same page and have the educated opinions, we have to make that opinion going forward. So it's a very complicated prolonged recovery from his first open B up by AVR, and he adamantly refused a re-op. So after the, again, multiple discussions, we decided to proceed with a valve and valve TAVR. So the case plan showed the cath no obstructive CAD. The femoral axis was suitable. The coronary heights were appropriate, so there was no need for basilica. And it was at this point we said, okay, should we make a decision on fracking? Well, we would make it post-deployment. So in our center, if we are going to do a fracking situation, we're not going to do a pre, we would decide on the hemodynamics post-deployment. So we chose an Evolu Pro Plus 29, which would provide 16% uh, oversizing. You can see our CT images here and giving you obviously the width and diameters of the annulus. And again, the ascending area, which it measured small here on the CT, but it was measured to 4.5 actually in the proximal ascending aorta. And we obviously, in, when you're doing valve and valve cases, you want to image in your brain as well, how is it going to look on fluoroscopy when I'm deploying this valve? So clearly you see that panel on the right bottom. That's pretty much what we want. Again, that's what we want, but not necessarily what happens. So, here in the sizing chart, again, I find this very, very informative because, again, this will give you the percent oversizing, and we chose a 29 because 16% I feel is very reasonable. 10 to 30 is kind of the range that we like to do with our valves. So here we are. We're obviously checking, doing our valve check. We crossed the valve, and actually we didn't have a tremendously hard time crossing, so it was actually we felt quite good. The angulation isn't terrible, so we felt, okay, you know what? This is going to be okay. So initial plan was to deploy with a pacing rate of 120 beats per minute. Initial attempt resulted in a pop pop. This is actually quite common in valve valve cases because you may not have the minute of rigidity to keep the valve in. But we were at 80% deployment, so with an Evolute platform, we can recapture. So we recaptured, reattempted with a pacing rate of 160 beats per minute. Another pop out. So we said, you know what? We're just going to do straight 180, get this person flat line for a few seconds, and we'll go ahead and see what happens. So we went ahead, deployed the device, and there's your device. 
After uh, 80%, it looked wonderful, but unfortunately, when we released, it sunk. And now we have converted our super annular valve to an intra annular platform. So we now have half the device in the, into the LVOT. Now, a lot of times when we present pop, uh, cases of these nature, we always present the pop outs. We don't always pop present the ones that do this because with the Evolute platform, it shouldn't really go too ventricular, but this is obviously not ideal. You know, we don't, we see this now as an, again, basically we converted a super annular valve to an intra annular one. So that's my expression. It's because what do you do? You know, you're not going to pull it back and you're certainly not going to try to expand this thing any further because you don't want this to dive any further. So you're pretty much stuck at this time. So we assess the vitals, assess the hemodynamics, we assess the mitral valve, which is obviously key, and then you assess yourself because you have to really understand there's not much you can do other than sitting and saying, please let the mitral valve not be terribly impinged. So the valve actually looked quite good. So, and there wasn't much interference with the mitral valve because again, what's the big issue with these issues? You know, when you have a valve that's sunk that deep, you obviously have a situation where you can impinge and cause mitral disturbance. So again, we saw a gradient of approximately there, and it's about 12, 14, I think at that point, 11, but we felt, guess what? Any further intervention on this valve, even if the gradients were higher, could potentially result in it sinking even further, and we did not want to take that chance. So the gradient was not perfect, but the, given the level of deployment, the concern was postal could cause migration. The mitral valve, MR, was still present, but it was no worse than baseline. EF was still 45 to 50. We decided to leave this without further intervention. He was discharged the next day, and follow-up echo one month was consistent with no changes, clinically improved, and his one-year echo, which was just done recently, it's still there. It's not pretty. No one's saying it's pretty, but we're all looking at the clinical situation here. EF is actually better. EF is improved, and honestly, not that much bad. The MR is not that bad. So this is one of those situations where I think you just have to say, we didn't hurt necessarily anything else going on. It was definitely a malposition and we definitely sunk. So again, you sometimes just have to walk away from this and say, what else can we do? Well, leave it alone. And obviously the circularity is being maintained. It's an intraannular valve, but the circularity is still there. And really no leak to speak of. So, but the problem is the questions are, would, we have gotten better result by a stiffer wire. Should we have used a balloon expandable valve? Should we have kept trying for a high deployment with a longer pacing run, even though we popped out twice? And did the larger ascending aorta prevent adequate contact of the superior portion of the valve, thereby lending itself to migration? So these are questions which I think it's great. I hope the panel has some uh, responses as well, because honestly, I don't know what the perfect answer would have been. And with the conclusions then, the patient did do very well clinically. But again, you can't just say it's good on the table. Patients are demanding valves more and more now. They want TAVR. But you know what? This is one of the things where it's a team sport. Maybe we should really tell the patient, you know what? Open heart might have been the best situation, best answer for this patient. And again, sometimes the easy way now leads to a very hard road later on. Thank you. You know, I, I still struggle with, you know, having, you know, we are about 40% evolute in our practice. This, the interaction of the wire and the device in terms of it being ventricular, just to me, in my hands, doesn't seem to be very reproducible. You know, I, I just think these things behave poorly. Um, and I think you could have certainly made the situation worse with if you would have tried to snare it and try to, you know, move it northward, because then if you end up with two valves and a big aneurysm, the thing, you know, so I think you did exactly, you know, what, what, what I would do. Yeah, it just um, wasn't pretty. It, yeah. just, it just one of those, you look at it, yeah. and you're just like, you just don't know what else, what, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> the only other place where you get burned, or where I've been burned on that is when people have had very thickened anterior leaflets or like MAC invading the leaflet where you basically get the anterior leaflet pinned and closed and you can get pretty significant mitral gradients, but you were blessed by having a yeah. beautiful mitral valve that, you know, was able to deal with that deep implant. So, so why do you think it migrated into the LV? You well, know, I'm going to be honest with you. I really believe that, uh, the aorta, ascending aorta was probably more dilated. I mean, we just didn't, I really believe there's probably low contact. I mean, it, it doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense why it would move that way unless there was no hold superiorly for this valve to stay put. Because again, we, everyone does these valve and valve cases and they rarely change that much, yeah. that dramatically. And we did oversize 16%. Yeah. I would not have gone for a 37% oversizing. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm, I'm actually really surprised. And I, I mean, looking at that, I, I would have considered post dilating or BVF. But I'm just, but what keeps me from saying that fully is I don't understand why you went into that. Correct. Okay. Um, because, and this is a good example of where perfection is the enemy of good. Srin, mm -hmm. great, amazing case, great case. Um, I thought when you started the presentation that you were going to show an example of something that you did to intervene on the malposition, but then it was sort of a curveball because your whole theme was, you know, stop yourself, don't do anything. A couple of questions. When you guys were at 80% after the 180 pacing and you were happy with how it looked, was your delivery system on the outer curve, mid, or more mid. inner curve? That's mid. the problem. I think we weren't truthfully where we should have been, but we were so happy we weren't popped out. We said, hey, finally, and you know, let's be honest, when you're pacing 180, we've gotten so used to it, but you're still pacing, there's still no pressure, and you want to be done. So I think we were like, okay, go, 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 let's get this, it looks good, drop it, everything's great, and that was the problem, I think. I think we were just not wanting to pace any longer than we had to at that rate. What, what would you have done differently in this case if there was significant PVL? You know, I think we would, we would have had to balloon it and see if we could have done anything, and I'd bite the bullet and say, you know, praise that it didn't go any further. Because I've never seen an evolute, I haven't had it, you know, ventriculized completely, but I didn't want to try in this case that we would migrate any further, and God forbid the coronaries have any issue at that point. Yeah. So uh, this is, is very interesting how, because uh, a few weeks back, I know there's been some changes in uh, presentation assignments for the meeting, but originally it was a period where I was supposed to present a case on malposition. So I had a case that I was going to show that was just like this with significant PVL. I post dilated it. it the valve was fairly significant, even trickily embolized. I could not obliterate the PVL. The, the Medtronic valve just would not expand in that location. I then snared it. It embolized aortic, but luckily not significantly, just slightly above the surgical valve. And then I brought a balloon expandable valve and everything was fine. So uh, the exact opposite of what you did, but your patient and your result was fantastic. And uh, so, thank you. The AOR is a safer place. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks. All right, next up, great case. Next up, um, we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Schwartz, who's going to present a case of horizontal aorta and TAVR. All right, thanks again to Paul and the organizing committee. Uh, also, it's pretty fun to have not one, but two mentors on the panel here with Paul and John. <laughs> Initially, you might have a little PTSD on this case, so <laughs> hopefully not too bad disclosures. So horizontal aorta and TAVR, we had a little conversation about this already this morning, but uh, just to go over it again. Uh, the TAVR therapy has now opened up therapy to patients that maybe not have been able to get anything in the past, and that's led to more complex cases that we're facing here. Um, the challenge with that is, though, you might do things where you're going to have to use a lot of creative um, solutions here. So for horizontal aorta, that can be particularly challenging, um, especially you usually will have a porcelain aorta accompanying this, and that just adds to the difficulty. To define it, um, in literature, it's sort of been anything over 48 degrees is about um, where the cutoff is, where we start to see problems. The extreme angle is listed at 70%, and it's actually listed into the self-expanding valves. It's not recommended to use it beyond that. Valve crossing can be difficult. You might have to change up your wire, your balloons, your catheters. Choosing which um, valve might, um, based on the angle, you might make a different choice based on what you see there. Alignment and kind of controlled deployment can help you out here if you're very cautious. Um, and then if you have, we've kind of already seen some of the things that can happen here, so the complications can come up. Um, not much about this in literature, but I, I think more the point here, not only can you have an unfolded aorta in the annual plane, but there's some tertiary curves that can come into play that make it pretty difficult to navigate and I have a picture of that coming up later. So just to get to the specific case, um, I'd like to make this interactive at some point. So we'll, maybe there's, there's a point where I'll ask you guys your thoughts, but 86-year-old uh, female, severe AS, her mean gradient was 41, her area is 0.7, pretty standard, lots of complications. She's in her 80s, she's on home oxygen. This is not going to be a case where you're going to be really considering surgery. She had no interest in that either. <clears throat> progressive symptoms, referred to our clinic, we start, started the workup, everything was pretty standard. She did have some coronary disease with a CTO, but nothing that we felt we needed to revascularize. We got her TAVR CT, I can't see all this, but the big thing is um, nothing too abnormal with the sizing, um, but she did have some peripheral vascular disease, and so we were concerned about either might, um, she might require um, some kind of IVL going up or just try it first and see what happens. But, so then we get to the CT scan. You can see the angle was about 58 degrees, so not the most extreme um, horizontal aorta that you've seen, but 
um, this was just a, a case that I'd been saving, so uh, you'll see why later. So very tortuous aorta, um, kind of like I was talking about with the tertiary curves here. Um, we knew this might um, cause some difficulty just reaching the valve and positioning was gonna be pretty difficult. You can see the heavy calcium in the iliacs as well. So had the meeting, um, thought to be prohibitive surgical risk, tower was favored. Because of the access, um, we were planning on possibly needing shockwave going up. The aorta was tortuous. We knew tracking was gonna be tough. We opted for the Evolute Pro with the inline sheath just because of the, the small access. And considering doing a, a BAV, uh, we've sort of started doing that with most of our core valve cases, but this is one that we just didn't want to run into any trouble um, crossing the valve, and we were not able to use EPD in this case because of the heavy calcification. So beginning of the procedure, everything was pretty um, straightforward. We just decided we, the, even just getting the catheters through the iliacs was difficult, so we just went up with the shockwave initially, got good expansion. Um, we were able to get the sheath in, um, did a root shot, crossed the valve relatively easily, uh, and got into the LV apex. Took our pictures there. Um, those should be videos. I don't know. Can you play the videos for me? Did the BAV, things looking pretty good. Any thoughts here so far? You might not have any, so if that's fine, if you don't. <laughs> but nothing too bad yet. Um, so we switched to the inline sheath, um, but we, as somewhat expected, could not cross the STJ, um, thought to be because of the angulation and the calcification. We tried pushing and pulling, some wire manipulation. We tried rotating the valve, pulling it back into the aorta, and getting the, the spines in line. Um, we did the BAV, still weren't able to get across. We removed the pigtail and tried to cross with a buddy wire, see if that would help. Um, did an, uh, another balloon to try to deflect the valve across uh, as we were going across, but. Again, that didn't work, so now what? Did you try snaring? Great. <laughs> <laughs> so we brought the snare in, uh, went on the opposite side. We snared um, the valve in the abdominal aorta, um, pulled on the sheath as we advanced slowly, slowly across the, um, the STJ and into the native aortic valve, got it into a position that we liked, released the snare, deployment as usual. So this is a long run here, but um, I knew this was gonna be a case I wanted to present, so I stayed on Cine the whole time. <laughs> so while we're frying the room, at least we can all learn here, so. But the snare, uh, we're pulling pretty hard here. We're still above the valve, moving closely, trying to kind of coordinate crossing, like pushing forward as well as pulling on the snare at the same time. You can see just how difficult it was, but we were able to get it across. And at that point, kind of high-fiving, get the valve, this was before, um, cusp overlap days, so, but we still got a pretty good depth on that. So got the valve deployed, everything went great. <clears throat> everything looks good, the gradient was seven, no, um, just a little bit of PVL post-op on day one, everything was unchanged. At her one week visit, she already noticed a big difference. At one month, the gradient was still seven, uh, the leak was gone at that point. And it, she ended up getting a CT for another reason at six months and things still look good. So just kind of going over a couple of the um, techniques here. So um, pre-dilation, I think, helped a lot in this case. We never would have been able to get it across without that. First steps, try the easy things, manipulate the wire, push and pull, try a stiffer wire. I Rahul mentioned switching to a Lunderquist. Buddy wire can help. The buddy balloon technique sometimes can help where you sort of deflect it across the valve, but that does require crossing the valve again. And so there is this um, balloon nudge technique that was recently described in literature. I haven't tried that. I don't know if anyone else has tried it, but it kind of makes sense. You don't have to cross the valve with that. Um, you just leave the balloon above it and sort of moves it into the center of the valve as you're trying to cross. We showed the snare here, which worked pretty well. Um, using the articulating sheet, if you're going to use the BAVs, uh, the balloon expandable valves, that can help. Um, but we just thought with the access issues on this that the core valve would have been better. Um, Resheasable, kind of plus minus here. It's nice to have that option if, if things aren't looking like you want, then you can obviously adjust it. Whereas if you use the balloon, it's kind of your one shot and you have to go. Um, and then if you're um, able to, you can look at alternative access. And generally, for cases where it's tough to cross, the left axle really works a little bit better. Um, so we talked about angle greater than 48. That's um, where you run into trouble. Um, it has been shown to have reduced procedural excess, increased PVL, and the, the chance of needing a second valve. The newer generation valves, particularly the FX, is, um, has shown already um, that with increased procedural success. And even though it can be difficult with self-expanding valves, you can get a good result. Um, and we showed the snare technique here. So we're, all, we're able now to treat a lot more difficult anatomies. Um, there's a lot of different techniques you can try. Planning is key, um, having in your multidisciplinary team involved, talking to the reps, discussing with proctors, that's always an, an option that I think we maybe underutilize. 
be prepared to get creative if you're running into trouble, um, have your equipment available, but it's always okay to bail out and come back if you're not having, able to get the valve where it needs to go. So, thank you. That's a great case, Jonathan. I think one of the frustrating things I have whenever I use that snare technique is kind of like what happened to you is that thing starts working back yes. and you're, the energy to reposition your snare is like you're, once you get the nose cone across the valve is, you know, it takes a lot of activation energy to do it. But I sometimes have wished that we did that earlier because mm -hmm. you kind of lose your ability to, to pull and you start almost look like you're going to cut open the arch with with how much force you're putting on your snare. So, yeah. Um, it takes a close call, um, partnership with your surgeon while you're yeah. doing that too. Do you, do you want to just describe some of the technical aspects of how to put the snare on, yeah. what catheter you use to deliver the snare, where on the um, valve you put the snare to start, and those, those types of things for people who are not familiar with it? Yeah, sure. So there, I mean, it's, there's two ways to do it. I guess one is I've, I've also had cases where we knew we were going to run into this and we just snared it ahead of time. And so going in through the same sheath, you can just snare it outside the body and go up. That's a lot easier. Um, but in this case, we, just, we were in there with an inline sheath. We didn't want to have to upsize and take the valve out and all that. So um, basically just got access on the left side, pretty standard. We put the snare in the abdominal aorta. We tightened it down. We, we, you want it not on the tip but as close to the distal tip as you can, um, that's gonna give you the best angle to approach. Um, and then I think the hardest part of this is just coordinating with one person pulling and the other person pushing. So yeah. talking with your surgeon, very clear communication. If it's not working, just stop and readjust. Did you, did you lock it down? You, of course, yeah, okay. with, with two. Oh, two. <laughs> yeah, we used uh, yeah. So there's a little gold uh, lock, and you can, if you put you know, another um, you know, uh, wire uh, steer, you can put that, put another additional lock on the back too. Yeah. Any experience doing it through the left arm? Like, do you think you get like a different trajectory in terms of like your pull angle or something? I haven't. I think that that's a good thought though. Um, that might be a little bit easier. It's just you're also reaching over the table then, so I, I don't know. Great case, Jonathan. And the balloon nudge technique that you also alluded to is actually kind of a really nice sort of quick go-to first. So you don't need to necessarily cross. You can just go in straight through where you have pigtail access. And all you need is a pretty small balloon, even, uh, you know, a 10, 12 millimeter, anything really just to, to help pivot. And that saves you from sort of all of the, you know, in, involved process with snaring and such. And particularly, for example, for a valve and valve, you already sort of have your, your valve demarcated. And oftentimes that pigtail tail you can just completely eliminate uh, so that's a that's a great technique as well and also a comment uh, I've also utilized a double Lundy technique I put a Lundquist in the pigtail as well as the Lundy in the LV and that way it just stiffens up the aorta raises it up a little bit and that can be another alternative way of using it. so there's multiple ways to get this valve across I think it's important though to have it all in your toolbox before you start the case. Mm -hmm. I think the Lundy helps a lot especially with you look at your aorta ahead of time it looked like an accordion you can just see how with an accordion as you push. And so getting that to straighten out really well would be helpful. Yeah. It's a great case. The other place where you just get hurt nearly 100% of the time is in people who've had previous aortic aneurysm surgery. And the, mm -hmm. my uh, surgeon, Brett Reese, calls it an elbow, but it's really a kink. And that, that's another place where you just have to just bite the bullet and put your snare on right up front because it will save you many hours on the back end. Great. great thank, thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Dr. Kulagianis, is here. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, to uh, Paul and to the uh, organizers for the invitation. So we'll switch gears a little bit, and we'll talk about, I promise there's no floro in this talk. It's going to be all echo. Um, so initially, I had a really cute, uh, really nice TMVR case that I was going to present, but we uh, this is a patient that we treated earlier this week, and I thought it would be a little more bread and butter, but I think perfect for a discussion this morning. So again, my name is Costa Kulianis. I'm uh, from Morristown, and these are my disclosures. Okay, so a clinical background. This is a 96-year-old woman, um, a good 96, uh, dyspnea, um, New York Heart Association, three symptoms. She was first referred to our valve clinic about a month ago. She'd had really just issues with, with, with heart failure. Uh, her cardiologist was having a tough time keeping up with her um, with her volume status, and she was in fact on oxygen by the time we met her on HOMO2. Past medical history of uh, TAVR back in 2007, a uh, 26 Evolute. Uh, she's independent, full ADLs, good mental status, but does you know need some assistance, and she's uh, in assisted living. And also of note, her uh, her son is a, a 
prominent physician in our community. So, um, so baseline echo, severe DMR, uh, moderate MAC, pres relatively preserved LV and RV function, and uh, you know a pre-TE was uh, deferred, giving her advanced age and frailty. Basically, you know we said we'll figure it out on the table. Although we had pretty good transthoracic. Okay, so, so jumping ahead, so this is her baseline mitral valve anatomy. You can see on the left-hand side, biplane with commissural and the long axis views. So there's, you know, there's a lot going on. So she has a fair amount of MAC, uh, leaflet thickening. There's a calcium, there's a shelf of calcium that extends really subvalvular, and that's something that we, uh, that we dread when we do, when we do tear. Uh, you could see that on the uh, orthogonal long axis view. Um, and then on the right-hand side, commissural view, pretty broad-based uh, broad MR jet. So a lot of MR, we'll jump ahead. I think her anatomy becomes, or her problem becomes a little clearer when we look at the 3D. Uh, a small P2 flail in terms of gap width, really you know, disproportionate uh, MR from what I would expect just looking at this valve on 3D or even on 2D imaging. You could appreciate the same, uh, you could appreciate the anatomy on the NPRs as well. You know, it's not, it's a pretty, you know, it's a relatively small uh, P2 flail, which has, you know, five plus MR. So it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't completely add up. Her valve area was anywhere, in, probably in the mid threes, you know, as high as about four, as low as about three, three. We do a couple of them, we average them out. So the average was about three and a half centimeters squared. So again, in the context of abnormal leaf nets, leaflets and MAC. This was her, so to add to the, um, you know, to add to the, uh, to the fun um, in this, uh, you know, frail 96 year old, this is what her septum looked like. So it's a complex septum, there's a PFO, relatively small fossa. So you could see it's a double septum, kind of on the superior side, all the way to the left. So that would be a bad place to stick. Uh, in the center panel, we've kind of moved the biplane cursor a little bit more inferior, probably a little more, you know, inferior than we would like. And, you know, we think that there's a clean spot to stick right there. And then, of course, you know, the, the, uh, the PFO that you see on the right. So this was our borderline, this was our uh, projected transeptal height, which would be about three. So not, not great to start with. And this is, we kind of like to plan things out with 3D. So we said, okay, this is where we would like to stick. So we're gonna avoid the PFO or avoid the double septum, kind of an inferior and posterior stick, you know, to the extent that we could do it. So next step, so, you know, many challenges in this patient. She's frail, she's 96, a good 96, but still she's 96. Borderline valve, leaflets are thick, there's calcium, there's a shelf of calcium extending down a lot of them are with a broad jet and a complex septum. So obviously I wouldn't be presenting her if we didn't do something. And you know, and the fact that we did a TE shows that we did something, but I don't know, what are the treatment options in this patient? What do you, what do you think, Paul? One NT uh, on the flail segment and call it a day. Yeah. She's, she's 96, you have a complex anatomy. Uh, you don't need to make it perfect. Um, the nice thing is that it's on the lateral side, so that helps you with height, because you gain height as you go medial lateral. And I think you'd get a nice result with just uh, one NT there. I don't know what other people would say. I think, I mean, you said she's a good 96, but I think the transeptal high would probably exclude her, but otherwise a transeptal TMVR would be great for the morphology of her valve. I wasn't thinking about that because she was 96. <laughs> she's a good 96, Paul. Good, you missed that. Good 96, yes. It's, it's so, interesting. A quick question, though, for the panel, too. How, how many of you guys are doing tea right on the table in this situation as, a, you know, as opposed to having all this data beforehand to really have a detailed upfront discussion with the patient? Because this is sort of, you know, if we look at our red light, green light, yellow light, right. where it falls, uh, you know, in terms of risks, benefits to the patients with all the anatomy. And, we, and I don't think, I, I think I missed a gradient, but, you know, you are sort of setting her up for uh, stenosis and complications. Yeah, her gradient was two. So yeah. we had a pretty good transthoracic to start with. We do typically do pretty good, uh, pretty thorough exams with 3D. So we had a sense from the beginning about her MAC, about her leaflets, about her valve area, you know, right off the bat. But yeah, we, it's, it's a great question. We, we don't do routine um, pre-imaging unless it's a trial. We try to put most patients in the trial. So they'll get the full imaging. But, you know, 96-year-old patient who's unlikely to be in a study, we, if we have an adequate TTE, yeah. I mean, logistics and all of that dictated and availability of imaging. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, um, I never skip the pre-TE. That's just my style. I don't know, uh, in fairness uh, to you, I don't know how much the fact that the son was a prominent physician 
factored <laughs> into some of the decision making. Sometimes, you know, we've all been in scenarios where of course this happened, yeah. right? Uh, and then in an effort to s streamline things, then you, yeah. you take it on the back end. Um, I operate under a, a rule of thumb that if I am considering skipping the steps that I deem necessary for the outcome that I want because of someone's age or frailty, then I ask myself, should I be doing the procedure? Right. Now, I'm in no way trying to judge your case or decision making. I'm just giving you my uh, way I approach things. Uh, and this comes up a lot, uh, for example, in left atrial appendage closure referrals and mitral clip referrals where patients have been medically managed for over a decade and now they are in their mid-90s and you're wondering, you know, it has, is it too late? Uh, just because we can do something, should we do it? But having said all of that, uh, you know, there are many times when you can do it this way and things turn right. out great. But I agree with Paul. I w if I was going to do this and this was all on the spot, one clip, NTR, you know, take a, a average result and get out. Also, I think that uh, for the operator doing this, obviously you have very skilled operators in Morristown. Um, knobology, knowing how to gain height. If you're going to be sticking low like this, you have to be comfortable with actually adding P, adding plus, doing everything you can because otherwise this is not an adequate height, obviously. So you're just really going to have to be mentally prepared, one and done. I think that's all you can do. Yeah. The fact that this is lateral, that makes it challenging in that regard because minus and P is going to put you more medial. So it's, it's, but. I presume yes. you're showing this because uh, you took it on. <laughs> so, yeah, so most of our FMR patients that are non-trial, we actually just do it on the table. DMR, we tend to do T's on most of them, unless it's a clean A2P2, you know, A2P2 situation. But, okay, so, so yeah, so we said let's give Tier a shot, and uh, as Dr. Saraja suggested, let's go with a, a skinny NT. So, you know, the transeptal was a, was, was a bear. It took a while to get to this, so we kept on falling off. So eventually, this is what we got. We fortunately avoided the, uh, the complex portion of the septum. As you can see on the right-hand side, we're a little bit more anterior than we would like. But this was the, the best that we could do uh, with, with, uh, with, with a lot of effort. Transeptal height was basically what we expected it to be. What we predicted would be about three. Um, we get the guide across, and you know, unfortunately, you know, it, um, the septum, uh, you know, sags a little bit more. So our height at that point is about two and a half. So I'll be honest with you. At this point, my, uh, you know, my inclination was to, you know, abandon ship. Less is more. But um, you know, I have a, a courageous and a, a brave, uh, uh, you know, IC with me. So he says, eh, let's give it a shot. <laughs> very, very slowly, very, very carefully. So that's what we did, as you can see from the bottom two images. So really, we're coming across, uh, really, just you know a bare minimum of height. Um, so starting to steer down, you know, we're already, you know, we're already on the valve basically. So any maneuvers, and this is what I'm really not comfortable with is, you know, doing these maneuvers inside the left ventricle. So we were kind of able to do some of this at the leaflet level, keeping everything closed. You could see the clip pretty well even when it's closed, at least in her, in her case she had pretty good imaging. So we're able to, you know, rotate, we're able to get it you know, able to get to where we need to be, just even with the clip closed. Despite, you know, many maneuvers, like we said, to try to gain height, this was really, you know, this was really challenging, yeah. But you could see from the bottom two images, we've actually gotten ourselves to a reasonably, you know, good place. We're gonna have to contend with that shelf of calcium, which is, you know, that's really kind of, at least it intimidates me. Um, but, you know, fortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, there is a slight, uh, you know, superior, you know, kind of an aorta hugger inclination to it, so it may actually help us, you know, get into that posterior leaflet a little bit more. So we were able to do that. So we open up. This is a small NT. Uh, we're able to basically squeeze in there to get the posterior leaflet, as you could see on the left side. Um, the right side, you know, it's a little on, on, on all the way to the right. The anterior leaflet visualization is a little more limited because of the uh, uh, because of the uh, the CDS. So typically what we do, you know, we could, if we can, we like to capture leaflets at the same time. However, it's more important for us that we visualize the leaflets rather than capture them at the same time. So not infrequently, we'll take one leaflet and this will allow me then to make, you know, manipulations in the imaging to kind of clear up to bring out that, that second leaflet if I just can't see both of them at the same time because of shadowing. So we were able to do that. Uh, so we were able to capture both leaflets, um, you know, confirm that we're right in the middle of the jet. We close the clip. The image is kind of going a little bit all over on the right-hand side because I'm trying to visualize, you know, both at the same time, which is, you know, impossible. 
and this was our this is uh, this is what it looked like. So really, we were pleasantly surprised. We didn't expect this at all. Um, inflow gradients of about three, and you know, little MR V wave came down from 50 to 20. So deployed uh, pretty taut leaflets, pretty good. Uh, you know, obviously a great result for this patient. And this is what it looks like here. So vena contracta area was about 20 or so, so mild plus. So posterior valve area was about two, mean gradient of three at a heart rate of 60. We typically will check these things either in these types of cases, we'll check a valve area even before we deploy. But I mean, this uh, surprisingly worked out really well. Oops, and uh, yeah, and that's it. So anybody who's with us during Marshall days probably gonna know what I would have done. Anybody know? Oh, adenosine. You heard it all the, all all day yesterday. So, because your 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 height was really low, yeah. And if you actually added the gap height to that, your your grippers would be less than a centimeter from your your CDS. I mean, yeah. so really challenging. But adenosine can give you height because yeah. it drops the leaflets into the LV. But you got a great result. It's a great idea. That's not something we've done it once or twice. But yeah. how often do you? So any, anytime I'm worried about getting the grippers on the other side, yeah. which would be in a low height situation uh, as one of them, because yeah. uh, you also had a flail. Yes. Uh, so, so the low height with a flail, especially to, to get the leaflets to fall into the LV. So. Okay, great. That was an awesome case, Costa. I think you know, at TVT, Cybal showed a case uh, of using an NT for a different application, but I think there is a role for NT in, in, in these type of valves, yeah. absolutely. Um, interested to get to where you were uh, initially above the valve on the atrial side. Did you have to understraddle, or did you have to pull your guide back to the RA at all? You did that all on the on the left side. Yeah, surprisingly, we were That's able amazing. to. Yeah, we didn't expect it, but we were able to straddle. But really, you know, once we started to come down, that's when. I mean, we've done, you know, we show the cases that work well. We've done these cases where, you know, it doesn't work out so well when you're starting with such a low height. So, you know, we were. Uh, you know, we were lucky, we were fortunate. And I think she just went home over the last couple of days off oxygen, so. And Kasha, so good question. Result. You had, you, this patient, on a side note, did you say she had an Evolute in 2007? Yes. And how did that valve look? It looked great. <laughs> it looked, I know, the leaflets look perfect. It looked great. I know, I took a, I took a drive amazing. by look I, at I could, it. I was looking at that, I was like, 15 years? I mean, wow. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 2007, 2017. Oh, because, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, I apologize, 2017. So, yep. All right, well, thank you again. Thank you, great case. All right, um, we'll keep moving here in the interest of time. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jason Rogers, who's gonna talk about tissue disruption and therapy. Or, I'd like to be Jason today. Okay, yeah. welcome Jason. Thank you. I've always wanted to be Jason. I mean, who wouldn't want to be Jason? He's taller, better looking, you know, whatever. So uh, anyway, so uh, I'm gonna show you a case here, uh, pinch hitting for Jason. So this is a 53-year-old uh, man he had a uh, surgical valve, age 37. Uh, he had an onyx uh, uh, that was done as a repeat. And then nine months ago, he had recurrent endocarditis and he's now uh, on IV uh, amoxicillin. So he had PVL closure uh, elsewhere that was not successful uh, due to leaflet and impingement. And, uh, and so he was referred here. So this is the uh, echocardiogram. So you can see there that the LV looks pretty normal. Uh, there's a pretty good amount of PVL. And you know, sometimes the aerogram tells a little bit better story than the echo, no offense to my imagers out there. Um, but you know, you can see there on the aerogram that it's, it's torrential, it's severe uh, PVL. So um, uh, the nice thing about how this is done is we do uh, a CT scan uh, to help plan the imaging intensifier angle. So. So here on the left-hand side, you know, I have Joao Cavacante and John Lesser who helped me with these, and it's, these are really, it's a really beautiful way to plan the procedure because if they give us the angles for the wiring, we don't have to guess as to which way to have the wire on the outside of the prosthesis. And you can see there that the left-hand view is the angle uh, from the CT that's predicted. And on the right-hand side, if we play that video uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see that the catheter uh, simply just falls. And look, I actually think Anane, I think you might have did this procedure. And this is Anane, I'm pretty sure, yes. Uh, as a fellow, she wired this in like five seconds. And she's really good, but yeah, I mean, she had help. So, 
Anyway, I'm just saying. So anyway, so so this is an easy wiring, and it was just beautiful. So if you if you're doing these aortic PVLs, the CT really really helps you in getting that, and it's especially helpful if you have a TAVR valve when you're trying to get between the leaflets that we all leave behind when we do these TAVR procedures. So anyway, um, so we then uh, send the wire out. Uh, we exteriorize that wire, and we create uh, an aorta aorta rail. And, uh, and so I like these aorta aorta rails. So essentially, we're going through the LV, out the aortic valve, and we'll tend to snare in the descending just because it's a smaller area to work with. And it works really well. And then uh, once we create that weld, that then allows us to pull our, our delivery sheath across. So as you see in the middle, there's a rail. Uh, as we pull on the rail, the key part here, and this is really important as you do these, because I want you to do something that I don't want you to do what I've done before. Uh, and if you see this loop here, we, and this TE probe, that loop is being watched by the TE probe as we pull on it. And, and the reason for that is because if you lasso the mitral valve apparatus and pull on it, you'll tear it. And I've done that. And so, and so you've got to close this loop really carefully and make sure that you're not uh, uh, wrapped around the mitral valve. And then it becomes really actually quite easy. So this is, uh, you know, a case that was, uh, could not be done elsewhere. They actually gave up. Uh, but honestly, it was, I'm not sure exactly why, because as soon as we put in the flexor, uh, we then put in a six millimeter AVP2. And then I'm just gonna fast forward here. And then we left that plug in, and then we went uh, with another wire. And I'm pretty sure, Anna, you did this too. So second wiring. So here, this is the uh, guide, uh, or sorry, just a regular diagnostic catheter with a wire. And then if you watch how much time it took her to get across, you see there? So there's the wires being deflected, and we're watching. This is our first attempt, and then the wire will go across eventually here in a moment. Uh, and then this time, however, with this rail, uh, look at that loop. It's a much different loop, not as friendly. And this one was around the mitral valve. And, uh, and so this one, um, we actually said, well, don't pull on it. We'll still kind of just use it and use the length of the loop to put the catheter across because it was a little bit harder to wire and we weren't, we weren't sure we'd be able to wire next to the other one. So uh, with, with that uh, loop extended into the LV and a little bit of push and pull, but not push, pulling hard enough to tension around the mitral valve, the flexor shuttle is then delivered and then through that, another uh, AVP2 uh, is then deployed. And so then we pull that up uh, to the uh, aortic valve. And uh, as part of the uh, best practice uh, technique, uh, we always, oops, sorry, sorry. Let me go back. As part of the best practice technique, you always want to do a floor review to make sure that we have not impinged the leaflets. We'll confirm that also on echo. Uh, we look on the echo uh, for PVL, uh, which is it's still there, it's still pretty, uh, but it's felt to be overall mild, especially in this uh, beautiful transgastric view, and then uh, we deploy them. So uh, the key points here for this PVL uh, uh, case I wanted to show you is use a CT scan, and uh, we have beautiful examples, especially with the TAVR valve, of trying to get between the leaflets to make sure you're on the outside of the frame. Uh, we use a dry seal, a uh, troll French, for multiple delivery uh, catheters and wires. Uh, I really like the aorta aorta rail, especially when the leaks are hard to wire, but always watch out for the mitral valve. If you ever want to see a mitral valve torn, I have a picture on my phone. I can share that with you. And then uh, for the ease of use uh, for these mechanical valves, uh, I almost always start with a 6 millimeter AVP2 when it's an aortic. Uh, and then I just march them around because the risk of impingement is really low uh, when you use those small size. And the truth is that you can get those through a four French flexor, uh, which is really a tiny catheter. And so those four French flexors go almost anywhere. So thank you very much. Paul, can, can, can you comment on uh, creating a rail through your mechanical valve? And yeah. I mean, that isn't something that, into it, that I've done. Yeah, um, I was, uh, as I know John and I were, kind of train around the same time, we were told don't ever pass wires across mechanicals, but it actually works pretty well. And if, if you use a glide wire, uh, it actually slips in and out very easily. And so I've done uh, rails, uh, both aorta and mitral uh, uh, for that. And it works, it works pretty well. You just have to remember to push and pull easily. So Paul, which wire was that actually that you crossed? 
Which wire? Was it a glide wire? It's a glide wire. So an angle tip glide wire is what I almost always start with. Uh, but one thing that uh, can be a little bit challenging, and um, I meant to show you in that uh, second wiring view, is that sometimes that wire, because of its stiffness, doesn't give you the angle of trajectory as you want. And as a result, every time you push the wire out, it straightens your AL catheter. And so you have to match the pushing of the wire to the straightening of the AL, which changes directions. And if that frustrates the heck out of you, then I actually just wire with a 300 centimeter whisper, uh, just like a coronary catheter, and to take a coronary catheter and just wire with the, with the whisper, exteriorize that, put a transit catheter through that, and then the O1A and glide, and, and it works quite well that way. So. Paul, I noticed you didn't uh, double wire it. I too do sequential wiring for most. Yeah. Um, is, are there any situations in which you upfront double wire for the potential for multiple devices? So I almost always like anchor wiring, and, and the rail helps with that too. Uh, but I honestly thought in this situation that one plug was going to be enough, and so I was wrong. And so, and so, and so I, and rather than take that out and start over with double wire, we were able to wire next to it. But I, I think double wiring and anchor wiring, uh, you can use the rail as an anchor wire, which is really helpful. Uh, but that just saves so much time. When I first started doing these cases, it was an all-day procedure. It was five or six hours, and it was, you know, bladder breaking, spine numbing, you know, just very difficult. But the anchor wire really helps. So. Yeah, the other thing, it looked like they had used core knots or on, yeah. on that valve. And I tell you, those are a bear to navigate around. We've gotten a lot of sheaths hung up on those. They are. They must have more, you know, structure to them than a traditional it's, suture. It's funny, and I don't know if there are any surgeons here, but they will, my, at least my surgeon told me that those core knots are the reason why they have PVL if they come back, because they don't get the knots all the way down. And at the same time, they're, they're problematic for crossing. So, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Okagwe, who's coming up to talk about uh, bicuspid aortic disease. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks again to the organizers for having me, and thanks, everyone, for waiting this long. So those are my disclosures, and I'm just going to be, um, the topic was to talk about bicuspid cases, but I'm just going to focus on a little bit about challenges with sizing. So this is a 79-year-old lady um, who had a recent diagnosis of breast cancer, and she was complaining of dyspnea and exertion of, uh, with, uh, and fatigue with exertion. So her oncologist hears a murmur, orders an echo, and indeed she does have a Severe aortic stenosis, we can see restricted leaflets and a peak velocity of up to 5.7 meters per second and a valve area of about 0 0.4. She had no angiographic evidence of obstructive coronary artery disease. And on her CT scan, um, her annular area measured about 5.3 perimeter 84. She had an STJ diameter of about 29.5 by 28. And just scrolling up to the um, panel on the right. We see that um, she has a really calcified um, raphe with fusion of the right and the non-coronary cusp, and she does have, um, in addition to that, she also does have, uh, you know, this really significant um, calcification there. She has um, her sin sinus of valsalva measures, um, all measures about 30, um, all over 30, that's 37 by 34 by 32, and her coronary height are um, suitable for um, w w low risk of coronary obstruction. She has adequate iliofemoral accesses bilaterally, but the one that is stretched out is the right. So in summary, this lady has a Severs type one, um, annular area that is suitable for a 34 Evolute Pro Plus, or FX now, I guess, and a 29M Sapien 3 with low risk of coronary obstruction with either. However, due to the significant degree of calcification, we elected to use a self-expanding valve, but the real question here is like, so what size are we gonna use? So the reason that's a problem is, I mean, I can assure you this is not a TAVR in a mechanical valve. This is a TAVR in a patient with bicuspid that had really calcified raphe, and we see what happened to the Evolute valve there. And we have emerging data that deformation of TAVR prosthesis can have significant implications on function, durability, having halt and hand. And therefore, at this point, to start to be a little bit more thoughtful about what the sizing could be, or what the sizing should be. 
So the different alternate sizings that have, people have um, explored, one is this uh, super annular sizing where you go for four millimeters about the annulus, and then you measure an intercommissural distance and use that to just try to size the valve. However, in this registry that looked at this um, sizing methodology, it was only applicable, the um, annular size, um, uh, measurements were applicable to 88% of people, and it's only in a small proportion that ended up having some benefits with super annular sizing. There's another refi based um, sizing, and this is based on the assumption that the refi is often very calcified, and is that point that actually impairs valve expansion, and incorporating that into valve sizing for um, patients with bicuspid valve that are undergoing TAVR may actually be more beneficial as the valve can more often anchor there. So what happens is that there's measurement of an, a new virtual annulus that traces around where you have the most calcification of the RAFI, and that's then used to try to determine what um, valve sizing um, is more appropriate for this patient. And this is predominantly done with um, self-expanding valves. This was um, studied in only a small cohort of patients and was shown to be, have uh, good performance, and so for this patient, using those two sizing, we have annular base sizing of a 34 Evolute Pro Plus, and using that um, super annular RAFI base sizing, we have uh, we could use a 29 millimeter Evolute Pro Plus. So I'm just going to put this out to everyone. What would you do? Uh, I was going to say I, I, I generally go big on my valves, or especially this type of bicuspid. I think a 34, but again the key issue with every bicuspid case is pre-dilatation, making sure you do an aggressive pre-dil, and I would go big for the 34. I 100% agree with you, but um, I'm going to confess now that that previous picture that I showed with the invagination was actually mine, and I did the pre-dil and did a 34 Evolute Pro Plus, and that's what happened, so I got a little bit more worried. So for this patient, uh, a 29 Evolute Pro Plus was chosen. So um, we still do co-planar views uh, of my institution. Um, and we, looking at our, our data, we found that our pacemaker, pacemaker rate is about 7%, which, is, which compares favorably with Optimized Pro. So we don't consistently use it. It kind of depends on the operator. So that's a pre-dilatation with an 18 millimeter balloon. And that is the valve getting deployed. And again, somebody didn't do fluorosave, and so that's the end of what you're going to see. But there was, <laughs> well, there was excellent um, valve uh, deployment there with uh, with the favorable hemodynamics and the main gradient of about seven millimeters of mercury and like little no PVL. We don't routinely do CT scans in follow-up, but this patient was discharged the following day. She still underwent her cardiac um, her breast surgery. And this CT scan was one of the surveillance CT scans as part of her treatment for, for the breast cancer. And on that CT scan, the valve was still there. This is about a year later. The valve was still there working very well with a mean gradient of only about six millimeters of mercury and no paravalvular regurgitation. So the reason I say that this is because we've expanded um, TAVR used to bicuspid valves, but as in this study that was done um, by one of our fellows, not all bicuspid valves are equal, and our outcomes will depend on what kind of, what the morphology of the bicuspid valves are. And in this low-risk bicuspid sapien registry, they excluded patients with extensive refi or subannular calcification. So we should be careful when we extrapolate the benefits or the results, the favorable results that we get from this study is because this does not always reflect the patients that we end up seeing. In the this um, cohort was 150 patients from the low-risk bicuspid study that were then matched to patients in um, the low risk uh, TAVR study. And they were able, to, they found that they got about 145 uh, pairs. And in those pairs, although the rest of the more hard endpoints like death, disabling stroke, and heart failure hospitalizations, compared favorably with tricuspid valves, the one place where bicuspid valve patients who underwent TAVR didn't do as well was in valve thrombosis and in conversion to surgery. And again, that should be a reflection of what we talked about, deformation, and again, issues with sizing. 
So in summary, bicuspid aortic valve stenosis needing TAVR, they're an atomically heterogeneous group of people. And annular sizing is adequate for most patients. In fact, in that Alvolute um, study that I just showed, they actually used annular base sizing for, for, for that. However, there are additional morphologic sizing strategies that may be beneficial to make sure that we optimize valve expansion, durability, and reduce complications that were higher with the bicuspid TAVR patients. And this standardized, multi, mo most likely multi-parametric approaches will be beneficial. And there's a um, current international registry that is looking at that to try to determine what's the optimum sizing that will be suitable to each or most um, bicuspid valve anatomies um, that is ongoing. Thank you. That was, that was a great uh, case presentation. I, I had a very similar case recently, and if you notice, there's like infolding of your non side of that. What would you have done that was a super high implant? Uh, what would you have done if you had to post dilate? Would you have been concerned about valve embolization or? You're absolutely right, and would I post dilate? No, the odds are that I would not. <laughs> That was a great case, Nina. What does the panel think about um, balloon sizing and if that has been found to, to really be helpful? I feel like we did that, you know, in the beginning of things, but sort of have shifted away. I, th I think with the quality of CTs now and our kind of experience, um, there's less of a need. There are some cases where it's borderline. Um, there are some caveats. I think sometimes balloon sizing, if you've got a narrow STJ, can kind of, you know, be problematic in a calcified STJ. Um, I, I think I agree with Tree's point about the aggressive pre-dilatation. I pre deal all my bicuspids. Um, I think you used like an 18 in that one. I, I probably would have like used like, you know, something in the mid-20s and really quite aggressively pre-dilated. You could see the balloon barely kind of um, expanded. Um, and, and then just to give a plug for the uh, Alliance trial that's just started now, the X4 trial, one of the unique features of that new Sapien fourth generation is that the sizing algorithm is very different. You know, currently we sort of take four sizes, we either use nominal volume or we volume manipulate. The new sizing algorithm is based on CTs where in each of the valve sizes you dial it into a specific half millimeter of, of diameter. And so, for example, in the bicuspid patients, you'll be able to say, well, you know, given the distribution of calcium, the type of bicuspid, et cetera, we may err for a maybe minus 2% or a 0% oversizing versus a plus 5 or 6%. So it'll be interesting to see if that pans out to be of clinical benefit. So, so Ro, can I just ask you, so if you're going to aggressively pre -dill yeah. and put in an Evolute, how do you size the Evolute then? So do you size it annual or superannular? I, I do it annual, and I think there's been this debate of annual versus superannular, and I've talked to Didier about, um, he, he was the paper on the um, superannular, um, and, and Philippe Pibero actually has done a lot of work on this, and I think just true annular sizing, but taking into account that sense of commissure to commissure distance at the narrowest That's point because of the calcium, mm -hmm. to decide then which if you're on a borderline. I too would have gone more aggressive, but appropriately, you know, you're jaded by that experience of the <laughs> underdeployed valve prior. That's exactly right, though, because in, the involution of a valve, the like invagination of the valve is horrible, and if it's too high, you can't post-dilate it because you're going to pop out, so you're really stuck. So again, I tend to be upfront as aggressive and as large as I can, but I do agree, once you have a high deployed valve that's not fully expanded, it is very nerve-wracking to try to post-dilate that. Well, I, I know that high implants are very common at your hospital and every year, and Guy couldn't make it this year, but he, he seems to bring a higher implant each year. And uh, it looked like you were even like minus one or minus two in that deployment. Um, in that LAO projection, um, it's um, a little foreshortened, so it may not really be as high as it looked fluoroscopically, but you're right, it's high. But it was too high that you wouldn't post still. <laughs> So it was high. <laughs> All right, thank you. Great, great presentation. So this, this is a first for me. Uh, I get to uh, introduce myself, not literally, but in a manner of speaking. Uh, we're going to do a little swap here at the end to help my colleague uh, make his flight. Um, the esteemed uh, Dr. Rahul P. Sharma um, is, uh, is going to be the, the next presentation, guys. Um, is going to speak about the mother of all structural challenges. Thank you, Rahul. Um, <laughs> it sounds so weird. No problem, uh, Rahul. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Uh, could we go to thank you so much? Um, thank you, Paul, for having me here. Um, when, I, when I got this talk, I didn't know whether to take it as a compliment or not that Paul gave me the task of speaking about the mother of all structural challenges. I think for next year you should change the title because, you know, for most of us, our mums are, are sweet, kind, and nurturing. 
Uh, and this case was none of those things. So I think maybe the mother-in-law of structural challenges would be more appropriate for next year. These are my disclosures. So um, this, is, this is a complicated case. Uh, it, it was a 51-year-old female tricus, tricuspid atresia who pre presented with progressive heart failure. I, uh, I made the mistake of helping out my pediatric and general colleagues about a year and a half ago by stenting a 12-year-old's left main, and since then they've started calling me with all sorts of weird and wonderful cases. And so this patient had underwent in the setting of a tricuspid atresia, and uh, just for those who may not be familiar with congenital heart disease, these patients for most of their lives look like Smurfs. It's a cyanotic congenital defect, and um, they often have to have a number of surgical procedures to correct the underlying issue, but also to be able to be sustainable with life over time, and it's sort of sequential. So effectively, she's got no tricuspid valve. She's essentially got a single functioning ventricle and a common uh, atrioventricular valve. She underwent a Glenn procedure um, uh, at age 20. She had a pulmonary band when she was very young um, to redirect some of that flow from uh, the transposed artery, arteries to the, uh, to the lungs. And then she had this extra cardiac fontan, which you can see is that panel C over there, where they basically create a baffle uh, between the vena cava into the pulmonary artery. And so she had this kind of in place and had significant aortic, uh, sorry, mitral valve regurgitation. So if we just play all of those images, please, you can see it at the baseline. Um, she's got really significant regurgitation, huge valve, um, huge atria, and then this huge kind of common ventricle because effectively you've got this non-functioning right ventricular um, hypoplasia. She's got that PA stump where the PA had been banded off before. It's, it's a large kind of myxomatous valve, and you can see there that she's got some uh, systolic flow reversal in the pulmonary veins. They called me up and I said, this sounds like a crazy case, guys. And they said, that's exactly why we called you. Would you do it? And I thought, well, if she has no other options, um, you know, uh, the principles are the same. We've just got to figure out how we're going to get across from that fontan on the venous side to the mitral valve. So I don't do this often, but I took the CT and I got um, our team to 3D print this. And so what you can see there is a CT on the left and it shows the Fontan um, kind of coursing up along the left side of the uh, cardiac shadow. And then the 3D printed model that shows the anatomical relationship of that Fontan conduit relative to that systemic atrium, the IVC and then the mitral valve annulus, which is in that pink. And I actually took a system uh, that I got from Abbott just to see if it would actually go up and, and kind of what the articulation would be in the angles. And then we tried to simulate where our so-called transeptal or transfontan puncture would be. And so this is what we did. Um, I took a pigtail up into the Fontan. Fontan pressures were about 25 to 30. And you can see there that this baffle, it's, it's a synthetic material. And remember, she's now 53. She had this in her 20s. This is now 30 years of hardening calcification of a prosthetic graft. So uh, I tried the Baylor system, didn't do anything. All I was doing was boiling blood in the Fontan. And so I went back to the kind of my old school approach, which is to use the BRK. So I took an agilis for support. I took a long BRK needle. And really, it was through consistent but increasingly aggressive force that we just managed to puncture through the Fontan. Once I got the needle through, the SL would not follow the needle. And so I actually used an 014 Grand Slam wire, put it through the needle into the pulmonary vein. I then pulled the needle back, used a coronary balloon to progressively slowly dilate the hole in the Fontan. I then exchanged that for an 035 wire, used a peripheral armada balloon to balloon the hole in the Fontan, and then finally got a 12 millimeter balloon and then a 20 millimeter balloon in there, which you can see slowly dilating up that Fontan. And I had no idea how this was gonna yield. There's been some case reports of electrophysiologists going through a Fontan for EP ablation procedures, but for them, the precise location is not important where they are. For us, of course, in the context of doing tier, it was very important. That whole shindig took me about three hours. We finally got the device across, but what I did was I actually took a confeder wire and placed it in the left ventricle and delivered the mitral clip with a wire in the left ventricle. And for those of you who are involved with clip, usually we'll deliver it over a super stiff wire in the pulmonary vein. Here, because I wasn't sure how this would track and navigate through the Fontan, across the Fontan and down in that massive atrium, I actually elected to put the confeder wire in the left ventricle and then deliver it, uh, the guide of the mitral device uh, over the confeder wire. So basically everything I was doing was completely uh, awry from what I would normally do. You can see here now the 3D atrial view, the mitral clip positioned over A2P2. Now things start to look a little bit more normal and more conventional. Um, position the first XTW under the mitral valve. 
uh, got the valve, the leaflet secured. This, again, it was a huge valve, very sort of Barlow-esque almost. Uh, I would say 70% of these Fontan patients have some degree of AV valve malformation, regurgitation, and about 25% of them have severe regurgitation like she did. And so we closed the clip under color Doppler, and we actually decided to put three XTWs, and just give you a sense of how big her valve was, to try and stabilize. If we can play those videos, please. So we did three XTWs, you can see there, like sort of three little pigs in a blanket. Um, are we able to play those videos, please? Yep, terrific. Um, and, and then she had a significant shunt. Now remember, you know, the Fontan is rigid, it's stiff, but I've also ballooned it uh, open quite significantly. She had this big shunt, which we knew she would not tolerate. We've got the systemic pressures into the venous side. And so what I did is I took a, an Amplatz uh, septal occluder device and closed that off. And the Fontan pressures at the beginning were about 25, dropped down to about 12 after we closed that off. So there was almost immediately a kind of a hemodynamic change that we noticed and appreciated. And there's only trivial flow that we could see between the, the, the extracardiac fontan and the atrial septum and the systemic atrium. Um, and you can see there, on, that's the pre-procedural view on the left, the commercial view with significant MR. In the middle, we've got post-procedure. There's still some MR between the clips there, but a significant reduction. And then you can see there's an improvement in the hemodynamics in terms of the uh, pulmonary vein profile now. So she was admitted to the uh, cardiac care unit after the procedure for diuresis and titration of the heart failure therapy. She's now been out eight months. Prior to coming in, she was getting admitted every three to four weeks with heart failure. She's not had a single readmission for heart failure since. Um, her EF's quite stable on 45 to 55%, and she's now on her last echo got residual one to two plus MR. And as I said, no heart failure admissions. Her only admissions have been for COVID and lithium toxicity in the setting of poor compliance. So this was an interesting case. Um, it showed that you know that sometimes the uh, these novel transcatheter procedures in these complex adult congenital patients can be done. Uh, there was an extensive collaboration. I'm very fortunate that my structural heart imager is also a congenital imager, so she's very used to looking at these weird and wonderful images. I certainly was not, so there was a lot of kind of pausing, looking at our 3D model that we had in the lab with us, and then kind of resetting. Um, Cliff, Cliff's probably used to seeing all of these because you know he's uh, got pediatric experience. Um, but it was important also to, to be able to bring in the Abbott team to get this 3D printed and plan, and you know, I spent a lot more time planning this than I would for a routine case, that's for sure. Um, but it also proved, and to our knowledge, this is the first successful uh, reported clip in a Fontan patient worldwide, and so hoping to publish this soon, and, and really is opening up the application of structural heart procedures beyond just the, the adult typical patient that, we, that we're um, dealing with. So thank you so much, and thanks to Raul for letting me go. Earlier. That was definitely the mother, <laughs> mother-in-law of all structural cases. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wish I wasn't going after you because I, I didn't do anything like that. Um, comments? Uh, anyone in the audience with congenital expertise on the panel? Anyone? Any comments? Did, did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Bro, what size uh, the occluder did you use? Eight millimeter. Eight millimeter. Got it. Did you size it on TE? Or how did you just choose that? Yeah, just measured on TE and, and based on the balloon size that I'd used. Um, and when I had the di you know disc across, it looked like it, it was occluding, and then rele before releasing, and just checked again. Perfect. All difficult transceptors are going to come your way now. <laughs> you know that's the second one you've shown in this meeting. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, and now it's time for Rahul Sharma to come up and talk to us about LA, uh, LAA through a PFO. All right, I'm going to close this out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to course directors, Paul, uh, for having me. And um, so th this case is uh, unlike all the other cases that we've heard here today. This is not necessarily a case of complexity, but maybe uh, the provocative uh, five, six minutes uh, of the session to just sort of ask the question of whether uh, this is an application uh, that we may want to use from time to time. Uh, next slide. Oh, I've got my pointer. Here we go. Okay, these are my disclosures. All right, so um, using a, a PFO uh, during LAA closure is something that um, I have uh, dabbled in and done maybe about a dozen times or so. This is by no means something that I do as a standard approach, and all patients who have PFOs, nor am I advocating for that. Um, I do think it's important to be precise with your um, location of transeptal puncture uh, when you're doing left atrial appendage closure, and of course, uh, as we all know, for tear, uh, for mitral valve work, and our, our EP colleagues when they're doing uh, PVI uh, ablations. 
But, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a famous diagram here that's been published years ago that shows us the different locations on the septum, uh, depending on what we plan on doing in the left atrium. Uh, there are advantages to using a PFO in the experience of, that I've had. I mean, it, it saves a couple of steps. It may save a couple of minutes or a few minutes of time. Uh, you know, transeptal puncture has become increasingly precise and safe. I typically use the Bayless VersaCross system. There are many other approaches as well, but um, I think, you know, avoiding a transeptal puncture sometimes could be an opportunity to avoid uh, perforation risk. Um, the disadvantages are that the different left atrial appendage anatomies, particularly anterior chicken wings, uh, may uh, make it more challenging to close the appendage successfully based on the anterior location of, uh, by definition, of PFOs. Uh, but what I had found from doing PFO closure is that every time I crossed the PFO for a patient in whom I was doing a PFO closure, the wire would always go to the left atrial appendage. And that's where I started thinking, hey, maybe this is something that I can run with. And so in the world of patient safety intersecting opportunity, I found uh, that perhaps this was something worth trying to uh, push myself at the edge of my comfort zone, as Paul put it yesterday. So I, I think uh, this is something that, uh, you know, I would submit, you know, could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So in this case, I used the um, Abbott Amplatzer amulet device. I used the steerable sheath. Uh, this was the first use of the steerable sh uh, sheath in the state of Arizona uh, for this particular case. Uh, the sheath, uh, as uh, those of you who may have experience with it, gives you about 120 degrees of freedom in terms of its anterior, posterior um, uh, torque or tilt capabilities. It comes uh, at, at a 45 degree uh, angle on its natural state, and then you can use the steerable knob uh, from which they, they leverage this from Agilis uh, catheter technology, and it has an auto lock mechanism, so when you turn it to the location where you want, it holds in that position. The amulet device, uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, it comes in eight different sizes. Uh, depending on the size of the device, there's different pairs of anchors on what is called the lobe of the device. This particular patient case that I'm going to show here in a moment uh, was a 22 millimeter device, so it had eight pairs of anchors. And then there's also a disc for additional sealing of the left atrial appendage and a flexible extension to allow for orientation of the device. Is the different sizes of the device. Our patient had left atrial appendage ostiums at measuring somewhere between 16 to 20 millimeters, and so we went with a 22 millimeter amulet device. So it's a 78 year old female referred for LAA closure because of frequent falls, with uh, one fall recently uh, causing significant facial trauma about a month ago, and uh, three months prior had a fall in which she sustained a left hip fracture. Her past medical history is as shown there. Uh, Chad's VAS score of six, has blood score of three, NYHA class one, and we went through shared decision making between myself and the referring physician. Uh, we did our pre-implant TE for screening. These are the different measurements of the left atrial appendage ostium, the landing zone, and the area where we predict the disc is gonna land. Uh, when I measure a TE for an amulet versus for a watchman, I measure the distance from the top of the cuminin ridge down to just about where the circumflex is, and then I always go about 12 millimeters in to where I know the lobe is gonna sit, which I want to sit posterior or distal to the circumflex. And so these are the different four standard views, 0, 45, 90, 135, for the measurements of left atrial appendage. Uh, here's the intraoperative TE images. You can see that there is, in this bicable view on the left, a PFO. And on the right, you see my Bayless versa cross system coming down the SVC. Um, in this next image, uh, you'll see another shot of the PFO. And then the still frame on the right is my Bayless system basically just tenting on the PFO, and then I was able to advance my Versa cross wire into the left atrium without doing any um, RF or transeptal puncture, just going through the PFO. Uh, here's a left atrial appendage angiogram. Uh, I did this with a five French pigtail and the Amplatz steerable sheath. Uh, after taking this angiogram, I obviously realized that I was not in the position where I wanted to be, and I further adjusted my pigtail and brought the sheath closer to the left atrial appendage ostium and made certain adjustments using the, the uh, torque capability and the um, flexible capability of the sheath to be coaxial to the ostium. Here is an uh, image of the intraop TE after deployment of the amulet device. I want to make sure that the lobe of the device is uh, at least two-thirds, if not entirely, behind the circumflex. And you can see in the image on the left, the disc is resembling a football, what we call a football or tug test, where we 
apply steady backwards traction on the disc and lock it in place. And I hold that tug position for 30 to 60 seconds to make sure that the lobe is not slowly migrating further out of the appendage. And if I feel that that lobe is stable, then I go ahead and release the tension on the disc and return it back to its concave or uh, elliptical orientation. So we go through the close criteria with the amulet device. This is a still frame uh, of the device. You can see the lobe resembles that of a, what we call a Roman helmet shape. There's also a degree of separation between the disc and the lobe. So we go through the different criteria. C being is the lobe at least two thirds distal to the cirque or entirely, to entirely distal to the cirque. Uh, L for lobe compression. Does the lobe appear compressed compared to its original conformation? In this case, it's clearly compressed. Uh, orientation of the device, making sure it's coaxial to the appendage. Is there ample separation between the disc and the lobe? And then, uh, you know, does the disc have a concavity or elliptical shape? We release the device. These are some, it's just a quick final assessment, uh, and the device looks well seated, uh, and there was no, no leak. The appendage is closed, no interference on the mitral valve or uh, on the pulmonary vein, and the disc of the device appears to be sitting uh, well beyond the confines of any other intracardiac structures. And here's an image of me pulling my sheath back across uh, the, the PFO. Um, in this case, this is the um, Amplats or steerable sheath being pulled back across the PFO, and then a still frame shot of what the PFO looked like at the end, which was the same as how it looked in the beginning. So, total procedure of time, you know, some people say, well, don't do this, it's going to add an extra however many minutes, or, you know, you're trying to save a step and you could take an hour or two to do this, but I haven't found that. Now, I've only done this 12 times, but I haven't found any increased procedural time when I've done this. I've done this in cases like this patient, which had a, a windsock appendage, but I've also done it in cases of chicken wings, both with the Watchman or the Watchman Flex and now with the Amulet. Um, the patients have had all of them successful closures. The post-op day echo looked good. We keep our patients overnight. We haven't moved to same-day discharge yet after LA closure, but it's something we're working on. And the 45-day follow-up T is actually coming up in a week, and I keep the patients on six months of DAPT after an amulet implant per FDA label. So my closing thoughts. I am by no means standing before you arguing that uh, PFO should be used in every single case of LA closure. I still advocate for precise transeptal infraposterior or some modified transeptal puncture site depending on the anatomy of your left atrial appendage. But what I am submitting to you is that in a world of steerable left atrial sheaths, uh, there is transeptal puncture forgiveness and there may also be uh, the use of a PFO forgiveness uh, to still successfully complete the procedure. And if there's the, you know, if the hole is naturally there, uh, or as I call this natural orifice, left atrial appendage closure, um, you know, maybe you could use it in certain cases. Um, and it can save a step as long as it can be done safely. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, uh, certainly can be, you know, considered in certain cases. Now, in terms of closing the PFO after the case, I've had some folks ask me, you know, do you do that? I don't do that. I don't see any reason to do that. Um, there may be certain cases where one could imagine that they might do that, but I, I have not had that issue. Um, and uh, I think uh, with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. That was a, gr a great case, and I, I think, uh, I guess the question is with that steerable, d d do we have forgiveness in all aspects of crossing the interatrial septum? Has it changed your approach, you know, thinking about going forward with that steerable right. catheter, or is it yeah. just for LA? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've, I've done about, maybe about 20 cases with it now with the steerable sheath, and um, um, I, almost all of them have been with transeptal, traditional infraposterior transeptal puncture. Um, in this particular case, and did it through PFO, but um, I have not uh, noticed any challenges with, uh, you know, successfully closing the appendage if my puncture site is not where I thought it was. I've had many cases where the septum is just this very aneurysmal thing, and my puncture site is not exactly where I intended it to be, and uh, you can use the sheath to get coaxial to the appendage, so it really has been a game changer for me, um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I I, I think that it's a, a provocative question. Should we use these PFOs for certain left atrial appendage work? Now, I don't think it's feasible to use it for tear unless someone has done that. Uh, feel free to share your thoughts, but I think in this scenario, it's worked well for me. That's fantastic. Well, thank Great you. Session. Way to finish. So, um, so uh, we actually have, um, we're not quite finished, but we're finished with this session. <laughs> But the challenging case finals are just getting started next door with lunch. Uh, and from all accounts, I hear the cases are out of this world. So, uh, so if you have appetite, come over. 
watch the Challenging Case Finals, get a little bit of lunch, and then we'll close out CVI. So thanks so much, everyone, for coming.